Raisha, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, what I said was thank you to everyone who joined us. <laughs> Um, thank you for joining this town hall that is hosted in partnership with the ACLU of Wisconsin, All Voting is Local Wisconsin, and the League of Women Voters. Uh, we have an agenda tonight to talk about volunteer leadership and how to um, be leaders by hosting conversations about voting rights issues with uh, both people in our personal lives, our loved ones, as well as election officials. So uh, we'll uh, give us a second to introduce ourselves and jump into the agenda. I am Raisha Farmer. I am the Rights for All campaign coordinator with the ACLU of Wisconsin. Um, the campaign is focused on voting rights, hence why we created this space. And then I'll allow Shantae and Eileen to introduce themselves as well. Thank you for having us. Um, my name is Shantae Nelson. I am with All Voting is Local. I am the um, state director for All Voting is Local Wisconsin. We also focus on voting rights and um, our, the, main, the bulk of our focus, if you will, is so that we can um, eradicate barriers to the ballot box prior to election day. And um, that's a lot of what we focus on. Hi everyone, I'm Eileen Newcomer. It's really great to be part of the conversation this evening. Um, I am the Voter Education Manager for the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin. And uh, similarly, our mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. It's actually our centennial, so we are 100 years strong this year. Um, I guess doing good work of empowering voters and vo protecting voting rights. Um, yeah, so I'm really happy to be part of this conversation. Yeah, thank you both for joining. And I didn't know that um, you guys' 100th anniversary was this year, so congrats. Okay, so um, we are hosting a two-part conversation, as I mentioned. I have a couple of questions that I'll ask our panelists in terms of how to have conversations about voting rights and voting rights issues with your family, friends, even people you meet on the street. And I have a few more that I want to ask them in terms of how those questions look different when you're talking to election officials. And I also want to invite everyone watching to drop questions um, either on Facebook in the chat, we have someone monitoring that, or um, in the uh, Q&A in the Zoom. And we'll get to those as uh, soon as we are done with the questions we have lined up. We also want you to know what to do with this once you've learned how to have these conversations. So um, we'll talk later about how you can apply these in your everyday lives by getting folks to request absentee ballots and later talking with clerks. So thanks everyone for watching again, and we'll get started. So the first question that I want to ask Shante and Eileen, um, I think when people hear um, voting or voting rights, they might think um, either they have a perceived notion in their mind about what voting looks like and what that means, or they have no clue at all. There's not really anywhere in between. So my first question for our panelists is, um, what are the issues and policy piece, pieces that people should be discussing with folks in their everyday lives? I'll jump in. Um, I've always looked at voting as being one concept, the one um, component of what the electoral process or the engagement process should look like. And so when you're having conversations with people with, with just in their everyday life, my thought process has always been incorporate everyday lived experience into the voting process. Show individuals how voting is connected to everything that we do. Um, at one point I was um, doing, a, I was having a conversation with some folks who were college students and their question to me was, um, why is this important? Like, you know, and I told them, I said, you know, voting impacts every component, even so much so um, it impacts the, the laws or the administrative rules that actually govern the campus, right? Govern where they can park, it governs what they can be charged as far as student fees, it governs every component of what it is that we may put our hands in on a day-to-day -day basis. So my thought process has always been when we are thinking through um, having these conversations, just start where the person is and find the way to show them that voting is connected to that. 
Yeah, I think that uh, what Shantae said is really important about um, the connection of voting to every, you know, every element of our, our lives. Um, and then I also think like when talking to people, talk about things like accessibility and how we can uh, make sure that everybody who's eligible to vote can actually vote. And you know, what does that look like for different people? Is it um, making sure that the accessible voting equipment is set up and people are using it at their polling site? Is it um, making sure that there are enough poll workers um, trained and ready to staff sites so that there are enough sites open so that there aren't long lines like we saw in April? Um, you know, even just like providing information to people too, there's a big gap in the elements of what people know about um, absentee voting, early voting, where to find other information too. That's really helpful. I think I agree with Shante when I think if you're not voting or talking about voting or thinking about voting, I view it as allowing other folks to make decisions about what happens in my everyday life. Um, and I think I'd wanna be a part of that process. Um, that said, I think what Eileen said about accessibility is really important. So let's also talk about that. When um, folks are preparing to cast their ballot, what should they know about what that process looks like, what creating a voting plan looks like, um, and what should they know about the different options for casting their ballot? Sure, I mean, we could talk about the different elements in um, creating a voting plan. And I think this would be helpful for people too who wanna to talk to their friends and family members about voting and encouraging them to vote. Um, I think walking through the steps of a plan to vote helps people visualize their, the process and them seeing themselves as voters and people who plan to vote. And then also if there are any like kinks or barriers that they might um, face along the way, you have more time to address those and, and get help if you need to. So um, one of the first things that you wanna think through is when are you gonna vote? Are you gonna vote absentee? And are you gonna request an absentee ballot in advance? Are you gonna try and go to early voting um, and learn what the opportunities are to early vote in your community? Or are you gonna show up and vote on election day? Um, do you need a break from work to go and vote? Are you gonna go before work? after work? Um, do you need child, to arrange childcare to go and vote? And that those sort of things. Um, think through if you need to go show up somewhere in person, do you have transportation? Are you going to, can you walk to your polling place? Do you need to drive? Um, kind of go through those steps and then think about, you know, what is it that you need to bring to the polling place? Are you registered at your current address? Do you need to find a proof of residence document to bring with you? Um, what are you going to use for your photo ID um, when going to vote? And if you don't have a photo ID, um, what are, what's your plan to get one in order to vote um, and make sure that your voice is heard on election day? And then I think another piece that's really crucial too is um, the, the research step. So if you're, you're going to go and vote, maybe you know the top um, few races on the ballot. But farther down, there are more local races and you don't actually have information about the candidates. So if you think through, well, you know, what's going to be on your ballot beforehand, you can do research and prepare yourself to go and vote. Yeah, I, I agree with um, what Eileen stated. I don't know that um, when we think about accessibility, that there's much more to be conveyed with the exception of understanding and knowing that those whom are poll workers are there to serve us when we come in to vote, and they're um, there to help us um, see pathways to access when we don't see them ourselves. That should be their role. Um, and just always knowing that if you run into a problem on election day, there's always um, a way to be able to report that problem and obtain assistance. And we usually share that um, throughout the election season. It's a, a number that you can call 866 our O U R vote V O T E. So eight six six our vote is a resource that is available on election day and many times leading up to the election, um, like over those early voting times as well. Thank you guys. That was really helpful information about um, all the things you should think about when making your voting plan, um, as well as what to what to do if, if things happen to go wrong and you reach an obstacle when casting your ballot. So I, I think, you know, after you've thought about what the plan is and how you're gonna get to the polls, 
Um, I think a lot of people also have some doubt or concern or skepticism around their votes being counted. So um, do you guys have any advice, advice for folks um, to be able to ensure that their, the vote they cast gets counted? Um, yes, there are a couple things that I think about immediately. I always share with individuals that you can log on to the myvote.wi.gov, my which is the My Vote website, and you can see that you have cast a ballot. You can look at every election and see that your ballot was cast, it was counted. It will not show you whom you voted for. It does not track that information online. However, it will show you whether or not you voted absentee as well as whether or not you voted in person. Now, with that also, I also try to make sure that people understand that um, you, um, there are certain things that you can do to ensure your ballot is counted. If you're going on election day, like I stated, there, those are individuals, the poll workers or poll observers, not poll observers, but poll workers, as well as the elections um, chief, and the election chief will be able to assist you with making sure that you complete that ballot in a way that it can be counted. If you're voting absentee, you can look to ensure that your absentee ballot was requested as uh, was was counted as well. And you can always, always, always reach out to your election clerk for assistance when completing a, a ballot. Um, you know, just kind of talking you through the components that you need to complete to ensure that it's that it's counted. So those are just some of the things that come to the top of my mind. I'm quite sure, Eileen, you have some additional things there. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, what Chante shared is similar to what I would share. I think just another um, way to kind of reframe the question a little bit and thinking through making sure that your vote um, is counted is also, again, thinking about the down ballot races and making sure that if you're voting, you're also voting for those um, races as well, because a lot of people, they only know who's running for governor and that's what they are president and they vote for those uh that race and then they don't vote later on and so i think if you want to make sure that your vote counts as much as you can um being informed about the other races as well is, is really important and then like shante said you can follow it up on on my vote you can call your clerk you can call the wisconsin elections commission and they can provide you some assistance in looking up um if your ballot was actually counted all really great, really great responses um, that highlight all the things you can do to get ahead of um, the elections in August and November and generally in the future. I think um, that's a number one point that I'd like to drive home is that the best way to make sure your vote is counted is by requesting your ballot like yesterday um, to make sure that you can do things like check your status on my vote. You can call your clerk if you need to. Um, and you can make sure that election officials are upholding your right to cast that ballot and have it counted. I think um, the reason that we have to ask that question is um, because um, we've run into circumstances where um, election officials aren't always prepared to have every single vote counted and, and we have to loop election officials into those conversations about how we can better prepare. So um, that being said, do you guys have anything to say about how talking about voting with your friends and your loved ones and people you meet at a restaurant look different from um, having those conversations with election officials? Yeah, um, right before I answer that question, I, I do wanna go back to your previous one because I am looking at the, the chat and there are some great uh, comments in there about other ways that you can make sure that your vote is counted, um, including you know not overvoting. So making sure when you're looking at your ballot, you're reading the directions, and if, um, especially for a primary, you're not cross-voting and voting for um, races in multiple uh, parties, or um, if it says pick one, you're not picking two, and, and things like that. And then also, um, I think the importance of, if you're voting absentee, following the instructions that come along with your ballot, making sure that you have a witness, um, you know, watch you uh, fill out your ballot, be there to sign, put their address, on there. That's one of the biggest reasons why absentee ballots aren't counted is because um, they don't have the, there's a deficiency with the, the envelope. And then also if you're voting absentee, make sure that you um, send your, your ballot back in a timely way. So if it's the day before the election, maybe drop it off to the clerk's office rather than putting it in the mail. 
And then Ryan, I'm sorry, I forgot your other question. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thank you for highlighting those points. Um, I definitely want to get to questions um, after we get through ours. But, you know, as folks are having a conversation in the chat, I think we should continue to uplift those. So thank you for that. The question was, how do conversations look different about voting when I'm talking to somebody I know or, you know, someone um, that may not be as intimidating as an election official? How does that conversation look different from having that conversation with an election official? Or does it? So I can jump in here. Um, the way that I'm going to answer this is through my personality, right? Um, I have been talking with elected offic election officials for a very long time. So to me, it does not look different. However, I will also be conscious, very cognizant of the, the, the potential that someone may not have that level of, um, ex not level, but that time of experience, right? So um, when I first got, I can't even say when I first got into this because I've always been the same way, but um, when I'm talking to an election official, uh, most of the time I am very conscious of the fact that they are time bound in a lot of ways. They have a lot of things coming at them at, at, at pretty much all the time. They have a lot of different requests, a lot of different pieces of information that are coming at them at all times. And so as a result of that, usually when I meet with an election official to talk about anything as it relates to voting, I usually set up a 30 minute time frame and I send an agenda and I let that agenda stick to 30 minutes. And so when I go into the office, I literally do have a conversation much so like I would have a conversation with someone whom I am talking to on a day-to-day -day basis because my language really doesn't change. And so because of that, then what I typically will do is I'll just lay out what it is that I'm talking about. If it is that we feel that we need to expand um, early voting, maybe the times or the hours or things of that nature, I just share, you know what, there's a lot going on within our community and I give the back, I give the background that's needed and I make the ask. One of the things that I have always found um, to be effective, I guess, in my um, interaction with election officials is I make the ask and I simply be quiet. Most people are so um, uncomfortable with that silence until if you have the ability to just be quiet, there will be a response. It may not be the response that we want, but you at least get them engaged in that conversation. Um, so for me, when I'm talking with them, I know that they have, I mean, there is a difference. It's just, it's a little bit more challenging for me to distinguish the difference because of my personality and because of the fact that I pretty much talk to anyone, anyhow, all the time. Same. <laughs> Yeah, I would add um, one of the differences between talking with your friends and family versus like your clerk, for example, is with your friends and family, you already have a relationship and an existing relationship outside of that conversation. But if you're talking to your clerk or another election official, you're still in the process of building that relationship. So I think being cognizant of that um, and doing things like Shante mentioned, like, you know, respecting their time and having an agenda and keeping, you know, focused on what it is that you're there to be talking about. I think also, you know, offering assistance. So if you're saying, I think something could be better, like making sure that you're part of the solution as well. Um, and then, oh, I had one other thing too. Oh, and then if you say you're gonna do something or like follow up with some information, just making sure that you follow through with that. And Aline, can, Ryan, can I just, May I uplift one, one, just really highlight one thing that Eileen just talked about. Um, when, when you go into um, an election official's office, it is really key to go in from the standpoint of solutions base um, so that when you are having that conversation with them, it is more of a, of a partnership and not a complaint. Um, and sometimes we have to complain. We, I mean, there are certain things that are just not working, but for the most part, if we can go in from a solution and show partnership opposed to complaint, a lot of times we can get, if, if even if we can't get what we want, we can get dialogue as well as help them help election officials to see in a way that they had not seen before. I can think of one instance particularly where we, uh, myself and another individual was talking to an election official. And because they are, you know, they, they work elections on a continual basis, they get into 
um, some form of routinization. It doesn't mean that they're rigid, but they get into what, what they know works. And so then what we did was offered like, hey, have we considered? And there were some things that we offered of how we could have we considered. And in the process of that began a conversation that probably wouldn't have otherwise been had. Thank you for expanding on that, because I, I was going to ask Eileen what um, approaching these conversations from a solutions lens looked like, but um, it's important to just note that, you know, if they don't have the answer or if they have an answer that might not be working to um, come prepared to brainstorm and collaborate with your election official. Um, and the example piece is really good, too, because I, I also wanted to ask um, if you guys could share examples of the types of people you're having voting rights conversations with in your life. Um, on a personal level or when it comes to election officials, who are the types of people that we're talking to? Um, I guess I could share a couple personal ones. So uh, my younger brother turned 18 in December. So one of the conversations that I had with him was like gearing up for the primary. Okay, make sure that your vote, what's your plan? Are you gonna go with mom and <laughs> make sure that <laughs> She like sees you through the process on election day. Um, and it was cool. I mean, he went from being like, ah, this doesn't matter to doing it and feeling really proud that he, you know, went and voted for the first time. Um, I also have a friend of mine who hadn't voted until the 2018 election cycle. And it was because, you know, I had sat down and had a conversation with her and like, was like, okay, I know you moved, like you need to register. I'm happy to help you. And then afterwards, she's like, oh, Eileen, I made sure to vote. And I'm so proud of myself because I did. And I know that you were going to ask me about it afterwards. So I didn't want to disappoint you. <laughs> so I think like, you know, having those conversations with friends that know you, know you care about them, and letting them know that them voting like, is important to you, I think really helps and builds kind of some accountability and just holistically, like their lives matter to you. Yeah, I'll jump in with a, a really personal um, example, and then I'll go into elected official or election official example. And I'll give a little bit of a definition to around uh, the, about how I define election official opposed to elected official. Um, and so I'll, that's just kind of, I, I make a distinction. However, my personal um, is many people who know me know that I have a very similar to Eileen, just not a brother. I have a son who just turned 18 in November. And so he voted for the first time in February of this year. I took himself and a cousin of his. And they were very much the same way. Of course, they're, they're you know, Gen, what, Gen Y. So they are just kind of like Gen Y, Gen Z. I think they're Gen Z. Um, so with that, though, it just, they just weren't really as engaged. And so once I took them through the process, I walked them through the process and they did the whole celebratory clap and things of that nature, had snacks for them for, the, for it being their first time voting, Aww. walking out to the car. And I asked, I looked at my son as we were getting in the car and I was like, okay, I said, okay, so how does that make you feel? And he was like, you know, it really makes me feel powerful. It's like they can't even win without my vote. And I was just like mind blown, like, yes, this is why I do this work. Um, so those are conversations that we have to be willing to have with 17 year olds who are preparing to come into the adulthood to ensure that, um, that they are aware of conversations around voting as well as newly 18 year olds who can vote for the first time. But then on, a, on, a, on the separate um, or on the opposite um, spectrum, when I'm talking to elected officials or election officials, um, election officials in my, the way that I distinguish becomes those individuals whom are appointed to monitor, oversee, govern, run elections. So that would be like the, the clerks, um, county clerks, city clerks, um, commissioners, um, the election clerks, that's how I distinguish officials, but elected, officials um, and or elected you know individuals are in my the way that I distinguish are those whom we vote in and so those are some individuals that whom we can have conversations with when it comes to voting you have to of course be willing to talk to those and open to talking to those whom are a part of who oversee and run and govern our elections um, be it um, upholding the administrative rule or administrative law, or be it that there is a need to present to legislators for legislative change. But then for elected officials, um, 
those are people whom we voted in. In some municipalities, the Common Council has a part to play, the mayor has a part to play, um, sometimes state representatives and senators have a part to play. So you can literally have a conversation with any elected or election official um, that represents any component of how we do this work in Wisconsin, right? Um, and just being open to knowing that those conversations can happen at any moment. And you don't have to know everything if you just simply um, hone in on maybe one item, one topic, and you feel comfortable there, it's fine. Great, that's great. Um, I another I, thing, go ahead, Eileen, sorry. Um, kind of going off of what Shante was talking about too, I think it's helpful to know um, with the person that you're going to talk to, like what is the scope of what they have control over? So like if they're a legislator, they can influence laws and policy. If they're, you know, the municipal clerk, they're the ones that set up um, the polling place and recruit poll workers and do training. And so there are different um, things that could be talked about with these elected and election officials based on kind of their scope of where they can make change. Thank you for that distinction and clarity. Another thing I wanted to ask about um, when thinking about like, am I having this conversation, who am I having this conversation with? Like, what if the elected official you're talking to is a cousin? Um, what if the election official that you're talking to is a friend? Um, how do those conversations look? Is there anything we should know about those conversations or does, has, does what we've already talked about still stand? Um, I'll say that um, what we've talked about still stands. Um, they're in their official capacity. I would still respect their time in the same manner. I would still do uh, approach it in the same way because they're in their official capacity. Now, there I will be honest. There are individuals whom are all throughout the state who are elected officials, as well as even some of the clerks I'm friendly with. We are friends. We, you know, I have personal. We have, you know, cell phone numbers. We connect sometimes outside of the work. Even in those moments, I'm still very much, um, I'm still very much aware of the fact that they are an official. So I do my best not to get common. I do my best to always uphold the respect um, and things of that nature, and never cross that boundary, if you will, of familiarity. Um, because when it's all said and done, we still have a working relationship, and I don't, I never want the lines to cross where the, you know. At, when I want to walk into your office again, it's like, yeah, I'm not even going to talk to you because, <laughs> you know, we got cross cross the right. I'm like, <laughs> you know, there's some outs outside beef that we, that, you know, disagreement or whatever. So I still approach it in the same manner. Yeah, I guess just one thought that I had um, while I was thinking about this question is, um, you know, if it's your friend or your family member, like you can talk to them how you, you would outside. But also I think know that like they are doing something for um, the community and to represent multiple people and you know their communications are part of the public record too so I think just being you know cognizant of that and um, making sure to keep things professional too um, is helpful. I'm hearing generally recognize that like even election officials are people um, with lives and respect their boundaries um, and I think that's a good way to summarize that. So I, I don't remember which of you mentioned, um, I think it was Shantae mentioned the meetings that you can have with election officials. Um, are there other ways to get in contact with them and talk about these issues? Is that the best way, the only way? What do you think? When they're, they're public servants, you can call them, you can email them. Um, I think it depends on uh, you know what it is you're trying to do and if it's like a long-term um relationship building i would say definitely meet in person and kind of establish that relationship um but yeah i think i mean it's fine to do calls and ask questions and um contact other ways i know like the elections commission even has like a um public like comment part on their website and so that's another way that people can um communicate with them and you know any issues that they have or suggestions for improvement um people can even make those comments there and they they get attention um from the staff and i'll just share this as well um, as relationships are being built 
with elected or election officials. And sometimes in that place of relationship, there is some commonality and maybe personal cell phone numbers are exchanged. I'm always conscious to all, I may have your cell phone number or something of that nature, but I'm always conscious to still respect your time, right? So, I mean, just even though there is relationship and it does, unless they, unless it's out there and it's like, hey, contact me anytime. I still have a rule that I'm not contacting anyone after um, a, a certain time. It's usually around 6.30 or so, maybe seven, um, just because I, I, you know, you still, you still have a life. Um, but in the same instance, um, what, I, what, we, what we should always be mindful of is that these are individuals whom have families. Um, they sometimes need a break as well. And so not allowing ourselves to disregard their humanity, um, but yet being able to deal with them in a way where we can still respect them within their position, within their role. Uh, and so just, I, 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 I'm very, very careful and I really want to highlight we don't want to ever get to a place where we become so common where I'm like, oh, this is just, this is Eileen. I'm going to text her. And it's like 10 o'clock at night. Um, I will say I have had to text or reach out to people a little later in times, in times past, however, not, ten, not, not later than 10 o'clock, but just a little later than my six thirty seven o'clock. However, um, it is, through an email or if, if they've uh, communicated that you can text, you can do that. But I, I still will approach the conversation with my apologies for reaching out so late so that they understand that I respect their time as well as their time with their family, if that's what's going on. Yeah, I would also add, you can um, do more formal communication too with them. Like I know um, for when there's like an elections commission meeting, the league will often have a statement addressing um, agenda items that they're going to be discussing, um, going and, you know, making public comment is really important as well. And um, it's good to have things in writing um, at certain points too. just say like, on this date, we sent this communication. Um, it said, X, asked for XYZ to be addressed um, and can help uh, establish kind of a, a record of documentation. Thanks, guys. So I have a couple, just two more questions that I want to ask before we get to the questions that we've already gotten in the Zoom and Facebook chats, but I invite anybody watching to throw in extra questions that they have now, if they've thought of them and haven't asked them already. Um, but the first of my last two questions are getting into more personal forms of communication. Um, should we and can we communicate with election officials on social media about these things? And if so, how does that look? I think, I mean, I think you can. And I think as um, coming from the perspective of like an, an individual citizen wanting to reach out to an elected official or election official, I think it is helpful to reach out via social media. Um, you know, there's definitely like communicating with people in different channels in different ways and some are more effective than others. I've even found um, for the league, sometimes I get a faster response if I do something on Facebook versus like an email even, which is like, it's weird, but it, it, it happens that way sometimes. I do think that there's a space for that. I agree. Um, I, 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 find, I, I feel that social media is a part of our communication um, right in this moment and just being in, as part of life. Um, I am not a huge proponent of contacting an individual via messenger, however, on their actual Facebook profile page. I don't have a problem adding them or um, reaching out from that perspective if, it, if it's allowed. If, you know, most of them you can, you can comment on their page if you can't and you have to do Messenger. I, I just, perso my personal rule is I don't because one, I'm not in Messenger enough to go back and read their response. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't, um, but I think that is a, a way to do it. I guess I could share an anecdote that I don't know if it's fun or not, but um, leading up to the April election, um, members of the Wisconsin Voting Rights Coalition were trying to do some research on where there were um, drop boxes in communities for absentee uh, ballots. And um, it was a point where like some of the city offices were closed. And so if you call, you just got 
you know, a voicemail. And then I reached out on Facebook Messenger <laughs> to some of the communities and like whoever their communications person, you know, happened to be on and was in the loop on what was going on. And so I, yeah, I just, I thought that that was really funny that like the formal way I couldn't get a hold of somebody, but the less formal way it worked, it worked great. Yeah, I think you never know when you got to be creative, whether it's commenting on an elected official's professional Facebook account for their campaign or um, I've even heard of folks tweeting at election officials to ask questions or to get things on their radar too. So I wanted to make sure I asked that question. The last thing before I jump into questions from our attendees is we talked a little bit about the types of things that we're talking to our loved ones about. Um, what types of things should we be talking to election officials about? I think um, I, Eileen brought it out really uh, effective earlier. I think one of the challenges that we find is that a lot of people don't necessarily know roles and responsibilities of elected officials. And so if you're thinking about something that is legislative a legislative change or state statute change, that for the most part is going to happen at the state level. Um, if you're looking at um, things that are maybe coming council driven, um, things that maybe potholes or, um, I don't know, uh, garbage needs to be picked up. It's not necessarily typical to contact your common council. However, if you don't have the number for maybe one of the departments, um, the state departments, you can access that information or get that information from your um, alder. And then when you talk about election officials, anything I think concerning voting, anything concerning the voting process, early voting sites, um, absentee ballots, whether or not you can um, have, whether or not we can have drop boxes that lead up in the midst of a pandemic, how elections are gonna be run, whether or not they have enough poll workers, whether or not they have enough ballots, enough applications to mail out um, to voters, what the electoral process is gonna be. So anything concerning the election, for sure you can talk to your election officials about, um, and just always, knowing that you could contact any of these individuals to find out like, I have this issue, or I have this problem, and you communicate that, and just being open that if they're not the appropriate um, department, that they will hopefully, usually, um, get you connected to the right department. I think you can ask for that too. Yeah, I would say if people wanna dive in more, um, into what specific issues they can um, talk to election officials about. I would point them to the uh, recent April election um, protection report that was co-authored between um, the league and then the Wisconsin uh, election protection as well. So I know that's available on our website and I'm sure we can get attendees a copy of that too. Um, and it, went, it goes through like different issues that uh, voters encountered on election day and then also um, solutions or recommendations for improvement too. So I think there's a lot of um, great recommendations in that report. And it was just yeah. posted in the chat just if anyone's looking. Yeah, I was gonna say I think um, Molly's working behind the scenes um, getting you resources that are necessary that we can also send you later but she's posted both the um, a toolkit that we've created to help folks have conversations with their election officials in the chat, as well as the report that um, Eileen just mentioned in terms of what we saw after April 7 and how some of those things were addressed. Yeah, um, I guess I would, to lift up one specific thing that people could be talking to their um, municipal clerks about, I guess specifically, is um, recruiting poll workers and having a plan to ensure that there are enough poll workers to open sites. Um, you know, in their communities and have, you know, more than two, more than five. Um, and then also the, the training component too, because a lot of the issues that our observers who go in and um, observe polling places tell us about are the issues that they see could actually be addressed if we had more and then also better trained poll workers who, um, you know, know the ins and outs of uh, proof of residence for registering people or know um, that the accessible voting equipment should be set up and, and know how to use it and run through the process if somebody has a question about it or if somebody needs curbside voting like they know the procedure and have a plan in place to actually offer it to people so it kind of a lot of it stems um 
to you know who's working at polling places on election day. Good point. And who knows if you're really feeling it, you might even ask if you could be a poll worker and what that process is like. Um, if you feel safe doing so in this time. So we got um, at least four questions, maybe a couple more in the chat that I want to get to um, before um, calling folks to ask. The first question is, how do we encourage formerly incarcerated people who are now able to vote, who don't feel like their vote counts, um, how do we encourage them and convince them that it actually does? I want to clarify you saying formerly incarcerated individuals whom are now allowed to vote? Yep. I wanted to make sure I heard that right. Um, one of the ways that I've always encouraged them is one, um, to share, like I say, I always take voting and I try to connect it to everyday lived experience. Um, and then I give examples of how one vote counts. We can go, I'm quite sure if we um, search the numbers, we can look at, I can think about an election that happened in 2018 right here in the state of Wisconsin, if I'm not mistaken, a person lost by like 23 votes. Um, and showing that, it, how close some of the races are. And then in addition to that, I always make sure that people understand, um, mainly because I work with a lot of um, the staffers of elected officials, when a staffer picks up the phone, typically what they're going to ask you is, um, what is your address? Typically. They're asking that because what they're looking up is whether or not you are a voter. And when you can attest that you are a voter, and when they can see that you are a voter, there is a different type of attention that you're, that you're given. Um, it's not in every situation, but I have known it to be in some situations. And so I always share that voting helps you to literally be able to hold that power, to be able to show that power. Um, and so I try to connect them there to make sure that they understand that your vote does count um, and it can be the, it can make or break an election that you feel like um, a person does, um, should a person you um, votes for, whether or not they get in that office or not. But then I also challenge them around not just stopping at voting. We can't just stop at voting, which is historically a problem. Um, we've always done so much to make sure that folks were registered to vote. We've done so much to make sure that people were, um, um, uh, have voted and, and turned out to the ballot box. And then as a I think as a community of folks, we typically stop and it's like, well, what happens to advocacy? What happens to um, lobbying our legislators? What happens to grassroots organizing? What happens to holding those elected officials accountable based off of what it is that they ran on? What happens to finding out the three issues typically that they've run on and making sure that we hold them to those three issues? A lot of times I also share with people Elected officials run on certain issues, and it is it becomes our responsibility to educate them around issues that are important to us so that they can begin to think outside of those usually three issues. So I try to make sure that they understand that you have power not just to vote, but to engage in the process. And because you've been impacted by a policy that's been in place, you have sometimes even more authority because now you can come from, a, from the standpoint of authenticity. You can relate to how this system disenfranchises or how this system makes a person feel. And you can have advocacy. It's a whole thing about heart, hand, and 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 um, mind. But you can literally advocate for the thing that you care about. Yeah, I can't stress that enough. So thank you so much for sharing that piece, Eileen. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. I thought Hunter, <laughs> you put it so well. That was awesome. I do have uh, one one more thing to add on this um, piece. Um, I know there's a lot of confusion around um, if a person has been convicted or even if they've just spent time in jail without a conviction, um, when are they actually allowed to vote? And the ACLU has um, paper resources and we have a digital version that we'd be happy to share with anyone who's interested and I'll share our contact information at the end of this so you can get that if you need it. Um, but I'll say quickly right now, um, essentially um, folks maintain the right to vote if um, they are in jail and awaiting trial and have not been convicted. Um, after, in Wisconsin, after folks have um, served their time, and that could either look like um, they're off paper, 
as some folks say, so they're not on probation or parole, um, or if they didn't have probation or, or parole after being convicted of a felony, um, or if they um, were convicted of uh, misdemeanor bribery or treason, like those are the two misdemeanors that will um, prevent a person from voting. But after you serve your time and you're off paper, um, your rights to vote are reinstated. So I wanted to um, make sure that folks had that clarity. And again, we have um, paper resources and digital resources that you can um, use if you need those reminders. Um, there's nothing else on this one. Another question that was asked is, how do we make people feel more comfortable about voting absentee after what happened with absentee ballots being left behind on the April 7th election? I think that's a really great question. Um, it's what I've been thinking about a lot and thinking hard about. Um, I mean, I think it's understandable with the news stories that we heard about, you know, boxes of ballots being found um, at the the postal off the post office. Um, you know, people are concerned about it, and I think it is a legitimate concern. Um, I can say there are a couple of things that may, might be helpful for people to know about that might help them feel better. Um, one is that you can drop off your absentee ballot to the clerk's office or your polling place on election day. So if you don't want to send it back um, through the mail service, you can drop it off. You can have somebody else drop it off for you that you trust. And then that way you know that it's in the, the right place at the right time. Another thing um, that people should be aware of is that the Wisconsin Elections Commission is adding um, tra a tracking code to the absentee ballot envelope. So we're going to have greater information about you know where your ballot is in the process and if it's stuck somewhere we're going to know exactly where it is and we're going to you know ad address that that issue and I, there's going to be more transparency for voters to know where their ballots are elected election officials um, at the state level and at the local level too so i i do hope that those things help and help people feel reassured about voting absentee yeah, Eileen, I think you summed it up really well. Um, I also want to reiterate what we said earlier about like checking your status on my vote um, and calling your clerk if you have any issues um, after you request that ballot tomorrow <laughs> or tonight. <laughs> yeah, I would add too, like if you have requested your ballot and you haven't gotten it and it seems like it's been a while, follow up, follow up, follow up. Um, you know, it, you don't want to, it is a burden to have to call your clerk three times to get an absentee ballot, but it can be make the difference between you getting one and not getting one. So I would say don't be shy to follow up if you think it's been a while since you made your request. Yes, and I'll just chime in there. Uh, you can also log on to the same website, the myvote.wi.gov website, and check to see when your ballot has been sent to you. They usually will track that. So you can find out um, even now where, you know, you're not necessarily where it is currently, we're in the process of that, but you can find out that, that they've sent you that ballot. Um, and it was something else I was going to say when I think about it, I'll chime in. Sure. I'll just throw in really quickly. I, um, when I was preparing for this, I checked my vote today because I requested um, ballots for the remainder of the 2020 year um back in march and when i logged in i saw that i was able to check the status of my request um not super thoroughly but like that let me know that it was on file um and i and i knew that i would had, i had requested one so i encourage like immediately after you request your ballot check and see if they know that it's it's been requested um and keep checking back periodically um let's do another question is there um and i think is this might be one for us specifically is there any materials about some of the offices on the august ballot such as what the da or county clerk do um so definitely are and i, I want eileen to talk about vote 411 and all the other things that are going on um but i know that aclu of wisconsin um we had had some door hangers designed and we're sending them with um canvassers across uh the city and across the state to um, outline some of those seats that were open for the April 7 election. Um, the plan is to do that again. And if you know folks aren't out canvassing because of the pandemic or whatever have you, um, then we'll get that information 
out to folks as easily as we can. Sorry about my notifications. Um, you guys have other resources to share? Yeah, no, I'm so happy that this question got asked so I can promote Vote 411. Um, it's the League's website <laughs> um, <laughs> where we publish our um, nonpartisan candidate information. So we send out a questionnaire to candidates and then they respond and we publish their answers um, in their own words. So whatever the voter or whatever the candidate wants voters to know about them, like we, we publish it, we don't change it. Um, I'll say for the state level races, we also translate the candidate responses into Spanish. So it's available in English and in Spanish. Um, we're covering all the, the statewide races, including uh, state Senate and state assembly. And then many local leagues are covering local races as well. And so voters going to the, the site um, can see a, a lot of candidate information on there. Um, the other resource that I would uh, mention that we have is we have an elected positions glossary. Um, and it's a, a resource that has like a short blurb about what each of the offices do. So like I know for me, it took me a long time to figure out what the clerk of courts does. <laughs> and so it, this is even something that helped me kind of better understand what it is that that office does. But I know that there are other people that have, uh, are in similar situations and we're more than happy to make that available to people as well. And that's another resource that, that we have available in English and in Spanish. Um, we've had a couple uh, additional questions come in um, since the since the first few, and I see someone raise their hand um, in the Zoom. And if you want to just drop your question in the Q and A or, or chat, then I can make sure to ask it. Um, first question, just so I don't lose it in the Zoom Q and A. In your experience, how difficult is it to help someone get a free ID for voting purposes? Um, they follow that up by saying there are so many steps from getting to the DMV to bringing documentation, et cetera. Um, so <laughs> in the state of Wisconsin, there is a law on the books that basically state if you are trying to obtain a photo, I uh, a photo ID for the purposes of voting, you can obtain that information or that ID for free. There are some caveats. <laughs> always, there are always caveats. If you are, if it is your very first time obtaining the Wisconsin state ID, you do not need, um, there is an additional form, it's, it's called IDPP, it's, I forgot the actual, um, that's the acronym, but it's, it's ID petition process, I think it's called. Um, and so that particular process protects individuals whom for their first time they're trying to obtain a Wisconsin ID in order to vote. Um, the, the difference between obtaining that particular ID, which you would apply at the DMV, and then you would fill out an additional form that basically states you do not have a um, driver's license or a social security card available to you. Um, so there's a process there, but you can obtain an ID specifically for voting. If you have that information, I always encourage people to take it to the DMV with them. The thing about this particular process is when you, outside of this process, when you go and you obtain a photo ID or a driver's license for the first time, typically what happens is you will go through the process, take your photo, things of that nature, and they'll print you off uh, a document that shows that your ID is on its way. And then that ID will come, you know, I think it's seven to 10 business days. With this particular process, you don't receive that. No, you do receive, and I'm, I may be confusing this, but this particular process, I don't know that you receive, yeah, you don't, you do not receive that particular um, piece of paper when you don't have the appropriate documentation. If you do have the appropriate documentation, you still will receive that particular piece of paper. Um, if you don't have your um, social security card as well as your driver's license, then that particular documentation or your ID will come in the mail for you. So I always encourage individuals, if you don't have the documentation, try to get to the DMV early enough to be able to obtain that in the mail prior to an election. Yeah, I would also add, um, the in Dane County, there's the Dane County Voter ID Coalition, and they are a very strong group of partners, including the Dane County League. Um, they've got a voter ID helpline where anyone in the state can call that number and get assistance. 
Um, and then they also uh, are looking for volunteers across the state too to provide um, in-person assistance. If somebody you know needs someone to go with them to the DMV or needs a ride to the DMV, um, they're they're willing to train people and you know do have trained people to um, go and help people navigate that process. So if you know somebody that is has trouble with uh, or it's going to face barriers when getting a photo ID, you don't necessarily need to be the one that knows the ins and outs of it. But if you can connect them to a resource like the Voter ID Coalition, that is a great service to that voter. And I'll, I'll just jump in. If you are in um, Mil the Milwaukee area, Vote Riders is also providing very similar information. And that that is also a contact where we try to send individuals to and we do our best to confirm the information that we are putting out between, we confirm it with either the Voter ID Coalition or um, vote writers here in the city of Milwaukee because we want to make sure that we're giving individuals the accurate, the most accurate information. Thank you for sharing both of those resources. I was hoping that you guys shared those. Um, I also want to say quickly that the ACLU of Wisconsin also has a wallet card size resource that um, folks can use um, to see a list of the types of IDs you can um, use. Maybe you don't have the traditional ones, but maybe you have um, IDs that people don't even know they can use, like their veterans IDs or their tribal IDs, um, some student IDs. Um, so we can also try and drop those in the chat for you or get those to you later if you would like access to that. Um, I think I see three more questions and we're coming up on time. So I'm gonna, um, cut off the time that we'll take questions live for now. We're gonna ask these last three and then I'm happy to follow up with everyone in attendance and everyone viewing about any other questions they have. So continue to ask them, but we might not get to those just to respect folks time since we're coming up on 7.30. Um, one question we just got is, I've been contacted by individuals who are at high risk and are afraid of going to the DMV for an ID. How do I help them? I would suggest one, depending on where you are, um, it would be best to get them connected with either vote writers if you're in Milwaukee. If you are basically throughout the rest of the state, you could get them connected to the Voter ID Coalition and they would be able to assist you in that process. Um, we can absolutely provide them, uh, you know, you can always look up online as well, but we want to make sure that we try to get them connected to a real person. Sometimes it just eases the process and we can talk to someone live. Yeah, I would add um, some, uh, some things I think are able to be done online now that previously weren't able to be done online because um, people have concerns about COVID-19. And so depending on the situation, there might be some things that could be done online um, that previously needed to be done in person. I also would say, call the DMV and maybe see if there are any accommodations they can give you. Maybe they could open up a little bit earlier so you could go if there's nobody there or they could at least tell you um, when there are fewer people or give some different ideas or suggestions of how to make it as safe as possible. A couple quick follow-up pieces that I may or may not be wrong about so you guys correct me if I if I am wrong but I know the Disability Vote Coalition may or may not have some resources um, on this as and I also wanted to ask if we knew anything about the status of like the indefinitely confined um, qualification and how that might apply for folks planning a vote in August and November. Yeah, I would say um, the Disability Vote Coalition has a ton of really great resources. So for anybody who um, I guess is a person with a disability or knows people with disability or you know just in general, they've got great voting information for everybody actually. Um, so I would lift up the resources that they have. Um, and then I know they also have um, a voter helpline specific, like to help people specifically with voter related topics um, for people who have a disability. And, you know, I would say definitely call them and get some assistance. Um, if you're somebody who, you know, is high risk for COVID or and needs to figure out there's an accommodation for you, um, to go to the, the DMV or or in another situation. They are 
they'll be very helpful to let you know what your rights are, provide um, assistance if needed. So I can't, I can't speak highly enough about the Disability Vote Coalition. They, they're really great. And I'll just chime in around the indefinitely confined. Um, this is a, a question that came up in April and we um, were at one point informed that due to COVID, many of us were, were under the stay at home order and people began to use that to basically kind of get around the photo ID, having to upload your photo ID on um, when they were requesting their ballot. Um, and I don't have the, uh, the exact language, but I know that it is based on age and um, um, health and things of that nature. And so my thought process is this, unless you have a legitimate reason to say that you are indefinitely confined, which basically is a person maybe who's bedridden or they're not in and out of their home like that. They don't have the accessibility to get to be in and out of their home. Um, maybe they are not bedridden, but they don't um, they don't do a lot of travel outside of the home, things of that nature. These are just some examples. It's not conclusive by any means, but wanting to make sure that people understand if you have the ability and the capacity to upload your photo ID, even if it is um, working with your clerk to obtain um, additional measures, my um, recommendation would be to follow the process to upload your ID um, because COVID-19 was not, is not necessarily something that we could say um, where we are indefinitely confined. And we found this to be true even for those individuals whom were quarantined. They were either self-quarantined or their doctor had quarantined them or um, suggested a, a, a time of quarantine. They still could not, based on the current law, say that they are indefinitely confined um, because technically after that quarantine, typically the plan would be to continue within society and you still would have access in and out. And so it's a little bit of a tricky question. I could, um, if there are individuals who still have questions around indefinitely confined, I will be, as we're listening to questions, I'll try to pull up the exact language and post it in the chat. Yeah, I guess, um, Shante, I think here is where you and I would differ on, on one thing here. Um, is so being indefinitely confined is a self certification. So if you are a voter and you feel like you meet the qualifications for being indefinitely confined, you have every right to mark that you're indefinitely confined on your absentee ballot request and go through that process. And so I know a lot of people who actually meet those qualifications um, are afraid that they're like abusing the system somehow by using a process that was put in place like to help them and make voting accessible to them. Um, and the Elections Commission, you know, it says that, you know, a person can be indefinitely confined for a limited period of time. So, you know, if I break my leg, I might be indefinitely confined for a couple of months. Um, and then once I'm no longer indefinitely confined, I can let my clerk know and um, get back on the, or get off the permanent absentee ballot list. I would also say um, people can be indefinitely confined due to age, um, illness, or uh, disability. And COVID-19 is an illness. Um, I, I guess I would argue that we were all indefinitely confined when we were you know, told to stay at home um, because of the illness of COVID-19. Um, and like I said, it's a self-certification. So if you feel like you meet the qualifications, you can go forward with that process. But I wouldn't, but you know, you don't do that just to get out of showing a photo ID. It's just like if you legitimately meet those qualifications, use the thing, the tool that's available to make voting accessible to you. Yeah, and thank you for that clarity. I don't know that there was a disagreement there. I was just more so trying to get the emphasis on don't try to get around uploading your ID in order by using that particular declaration. So thank you. I think that makes sense. If you if you need to use, if you need to mark that you're indefinitely confined, you probably are, and you don't need to worry about abusing the system. But obviously, let's not start. If you um, if you can provide a ID, an ID, you should you should probably do that. Um, thanking everyone again because we're past seven thirty on time, and I just have a couple more things that I want to make sure we get to that are important. First is these last two questions. Um, Eileen, someone had a follow-up to uh, your mention of the Vote 411 resource. They asked, uh, when will it be published? Yeah, um, so the, in the lead up to um, the August primary, 
our voter guide is going to be published on June 24th. And that's actually the day before absentee ballots get sent out to everyone who is currently on the list. Um, and then gearing up for the November election, um, we'll have the guide updated and republished on September 17th, I believe is the, the date. And that also coincides with when um, absentee ballots will be sent out for the November election. Great, that was the next question. Um, someone also asked when they would receive their ballots. Um, I think I'm especially curious about that if you requested ballots for the year back in March. Um, I'll just quickly say like my personal timeline is if I haven't received my ballot within, like if I'm just now, um, if I'm requesting closer to the election and I haven't received it within a week, then I would start to follow up with my clerk and, and, and check my status on my vote. Um, but can we say more about when people can expect to get their ballots, especially if they've requested them in advance? Yeah, if you have an active request right now, um, your clerk is supposed to send out your ballot um, on June 25th. So, you know, it takes time for the mail to get to you, maybe give it a week. And if you haven't gotten there, gotten it yet, um, definitely follow up. And then I would say if you have made your, if you make your request closer to election day, um, you know, it could take up to a week to get your ballot, but as you get closer to election day, I think, you know, make sure to follow up more if you, if it seems like it's been a while since you made your request and haven't gotten it yet to kind of see where it's at. Thanks. Okay, um, I think I've gotten to all the questions that were asked. Again, if you have future questions, we can't get to them on the live today for the sake of time, but we will follow up with you guys if you have additional questions. Um, via email or whatever have you. So still ask questions if you have them. I would very quickly like to say that, you know, now that you know how to have these conversations, we've talked about some specific issues that you might need to talk about. Um, now it's important to take these conversations back to your communities and to take these conversations back to your clerks. So I want to call everyone watching this to do that. Um, and I think one of the most important places to start is by requesting your absentee ballot if you haven't already requested yours. Um, and then I challenge you to activate your personal networks and contact five more people, get them to request their absentee ballots, and get them to activate their networks and contact five of their own people. So we're starting a tree funnel here. Um, and in case it's needed, I've prepared a very, very quick um, slideshow to talk about how to request absentee ballots. So I'm going to share my screen here. Bear with me. Can everyone see what I'm working with here? Great. So how do you request your absentee ballots for the fall elections on my vote? Here's how. Um, so the first thing you need to do is go to myvote.wi.gov, which we've mentioned once or twice in this before. Um, but here is the site again in case you need to see how it's spelled out. And then I have some screenshots from when I requested my ballots back in March um, to help give us some visual. So as this is the thing that you'll see once you go to that website. And the first thing you'll see um, at the top is vote absentee. So you're going to want to click that. And then you'll be redirected to a search engine where you can input your personal information. Um, my vote is set up to find registered voters. Um, and if you're not registered, there's also an option to register on the site. If you are registered, then they will locate your information. And I've, for the sake of privacy, um, omitted part of the screen here, but you'll see above the information that you see on my screen here, you'll see your address, um, maybe a couple other pieces of sensitive information, and then you'll also see your name and your date of birth. Um, once you've identified yourself and if your information is correct, then you can click Request Absentee Ballot, that blue button. After that, you'll be asked to choose the address um, that you want your absentee ballot mailed to. It might be the address that they have on file for you that you registered with. It might be a different address. Make sure that you click the correct box. You see there's an option um, for it to go to the above address, which is the one they'll have on file, versus I want my ballot to go to a different address, and it'll have you type that in and validate it. 
after you've chosen your address, it might ask you um, to upload your ID if it doesn't have that on file. We've mentioned that a couple times in this presentation today. When I requested back in March, my ID was not on file. So I had to go through this process, um, which is good for me to be able to show you guys. So most people can just, if you're requesting on your phone, for example, you can just um, take a picture of your ID and upload it that way. That way. That's what I did. Um, you can also scan and upload a, a, the paper copy if, if that is your style. Um, but you can click the green Add Files button to do that and follow the prompts. And then after you uh, uploaded your ID, it's going to ask you which ballots you want. So back in March, I requested all of mine. Um, I wanted them for the year. I want you to know that just because you request a ballot, that doesn't mean you're committing to voting by absentee, absentee excuse me. So that doesn't mean that um, when August comes around, like the Wisconsin Election Commission is not gonna let me vote in person or anything like that. Um, that's your choice to make when it comes down to that time. I wasn't sure where we would be in August and November. So I just decided to request all of my ballots um, right off the bat. And then you have to certify your requests, of course. And I think this is the first step um, into securing the fact that your um, request went through, securing the fact that you will be mailed your ballot, securing the fact that ultimately your ballot will count. Um, make sure you see this error message. Um, I hesitated to share this story because I had this experience, but I requested um, my ballots for the year a little over like 10 days prior to the election which the lesson learned is don't request them so close to the election because we never know what's gonna happen. Um, but I requested my ballot 10 days before April 7, and a little over a week later, I found out that my request wasn't on file. Um, and so seeing this message um, is definitely helpful to make sure that your um, request has been received and will be processed. But I also was quickly able to follow up with my clerk and they expedited um, my absentee ballot request immediately. So really establishing multiple ways of making sure that your um, request was received, both, both looking for this message and also just checking back on my vote to see your request status and also just following up with your clerk, like I'm paranoid like that. So I, I'll probably be doing all three closer to um, August, but I think making sure that you check as frequently as possible on all the channels is really important. And the, your munis municipal clerk is the person that you'll contact about this. I know we've talked about a couple different types of clerks today. Lastly, I just have a video here that um, sort of speedily shows you the process um, and it'll be just another minute to watch. To vote by mail, you must be a registered voter. If you are already registered to vote, you can request an absentee ballot online at myvote.wi.gov. From the My Vote Wisconsin homepage, select Vote Absentee. Then confirm that you are a registered voter by entering your name and date of birth and click the search button. Be sure to enter your name exactly as it appears on your voter registration. Confirm that the name and address that appear are yours and click Request Absentee Ballot. Next, check the box to confirm that the name and address listed are correct. This is the address your absentee ballot will be mailed to. If you'd like to have your absentee ballot mailed to a different address, check that box too and enter the address where you'd like your absentee ballot to be sent. Then click Validate Address and continue. Next, check the box next to each upcoming election for which you'd like to receive an absentee ballot and click the box to certify that you are a qualified elector in the state of Wisconsin and that all the information you have provided is true and correct. If you already have a state-issued driver's license or valid photo ID on file, once you click Request Ballot, you're finished. Otherwise, you'll be prompted to upload a copy. Just follow the instructions on screen and you'll be done. As always, if you run into any problems, call the Nonpartisan Election Protection Hotline at 866-OUR-VOTE. That's 866 866-866.
that number on screen really quickly in case anyone needed to check it out. But um, just so everyone knows, we have uh, recorded this presentation. Um, some of you also can see that it's on Facebook Live, the ACLU of Wisconsin's Facebook page. So um, you can always check back there or we'll in the next few days post this um, conversation to YouTube. So you can check back in either place in case you need it. Um, but yeah, I wanted to thank Shante for providing um, that helpful video um, from All Voting is Loco and um, say that it's really that easy to request your ballot. So I hope that no one is terrified about requesting a, a ballot. I hope that folks feel empowered and ready to encourage five more folks to request their ballots and tell them to encourage five of their folks to request their ballots. Uh, and after that, I think we should continue having these conversations between now and August. I don't want these conversations about the elections to stop now um, because I don't want them to um, get lost among us or be in hindsight. So I also wanted to let folks know that um, we've drafted a toolkit that you can use to have conversations with your clerks about um, voting rights and all that that pertains. And so um, as we're wrapping that up, we have created a Google form that you can um, fill out to request that toolkit. It's super thorough. It has everything from um, the messaging that you can use to talk to election officials, to um, what are the kinds of things that we're talking about, like what policy issues do we care about, um, to the different ways that you can have conversations with election officials and so much more. So if you're interested in that um, thorough resource, then there's a link here for you to um, write either write down to uh, follow up on that request or I believe uh, Molly can drop those in the chat for you as well. We can also send it out to everyone who um, registered for this training. Um, but that's it. I want to thank everyone for especially going um, over time with us and, and caring enough about voting rights to um, take more than an hour out of the night to have these conversations. Um, all of our contact information is here on this slide in case you need it, but um, thank you Shante and Eileen for joining these conversa this conversation today, and I hope that the conversations continue. Um, I wish everyone a good night. Thank you.